You're looking at Starfleet's flagship vessel, the Galaxy-class Starship USS Enterprise. Registration number NCC-1701D. Incorporating the latest developments in warp field theory, sensor capabilities, and defensive systems, this ship represents the United Federation of Planets' greatest technological achievement. I'm Commander William T. Riker, and for the past seven years, I've had the honor of serving as first officer of this vessel. My job is to make sure the ship is 100% ready at all times to carry out her captain's instructions. And that requires me to be intimately familiar with every detail of her operation. Over the course of this tour, I'll be sharing some of those details with you. If at any time you would like to interrupt this tour to explore on your own, just activate the tour interrupt control. The bridge. After being aboard the Enterprise for any length of time, you quickly come to think of it as a living entity. And you come to think of this area of the ship as its guiding intelligence. Located on deck one, at the very top of the saucer section, the bridge provides for centralization of all command and control functions. This amount of control is only possible through extensive use of the ship's computer. The computer carries out all routine operations supervised by the officers seated at the two forward duty stations, ops and con. Don't be, don't be fooled into thinking that the computer really runs the enterprise. During alert situations, control of every critical operation is in the hands of a trained Starfleet officer. This is the captain's ready room located just off the main bridge. This suite serves as an office. Note the desk and computer terminal, but it's also a little more than that. Captain Picard has taken care to surround himself certain items, Shakespeare's works, Livingston, his lionfish, a model of the stargazer, the first starship he commanded. Items that, as he puts it, give him a much needed perspective on his duties. Because while it may be my job to see that the Enterprise is fully prepared to deal with whatever we find out here in space, it's the captain who has to choose our ultimate course of action. The ready room gives him a place to do just that, get ready to make the hard decisions that confront a starship captain every day. Deck 36, main engineering, the very heart of our starship. Without the massive amounts of power being generated by the matter-antimatter reactor, not only warp travel, but our very survival in space would not be possible. These critical systems require constant fine-tuning and round-the-clock attention. And more often than not, you'll find our chief engineer, Commander Geordi LaForge, hard at work here, checking the master system's display or observing the core reactor patterns from his office. An important note about this facility. In extreme emergencies, it can be reconfigured to emulate con, ops, tactical, and other command operations, including limited flight control, fun control functions. Here aboard the Enterprise, our primary mission is exploration. The technology contained in this room gives us incredible flexibility in carrying out that assignment. This is the transporter room, one of four such facilities located here on Deck 6. Two others are located on Deck 14. Transporting makes some people I know nervous, but it's really a straightforward process. You stand on the transporter pad. The overhead scanners convert your body into a stream of subatomic particles. You're transported thousands of kilometers to your destination and then reintegrated atom by atom. Atom. What could be safer? Sick Bay serves as the primary medical care facility for all of the 1,012 crew and family members aboard the Enterprise. Each of these bio beds is directly tied into the sensor unit above it, aiding in the diagnosis of most ailments regardless of the species of the patient. And should surgery be necessary, the overhead sensor cluster you see here provides even more comprehensive readings. readings. In the hands of the wrong doctor, all this equipment could be a little bit intimidating, which is why I'm glad for the reassuring presence of our chief medical officer, Dr. Beverly Crusher. Ten forward. This is the ten forward lounge so named because it occupies 
most of the forward area of the ship on deck 10. Like the holodeck, 10 forward is a place for the crew to relax and unwind from the day's cares. The spectacular view of the stars through the bay windows here certainly helps to put things in perspective. But this is mainly a place where the crew comes to enjoy each other's company, to play a game of 3D chess, or just hash things out over a drink. It's really like an old-style saloon more than anything else, complete with its own bartender, an amateur psychologist, Gunnarist Guinan, who also serves up the meanest batch of synthahol this side of the Ferengi border. The Observation Lounge. Critical decisions concerning the Enterprise's mission are, of course, Captain Picard's to make. Yet whenever possible, he likes to use his senior officers as a sounding board on those issues. This lounge, located directly off the bridge on Deck 1, has been specially outfitted for that purpose. Note the conference table and accompanying pad units, as well as the two large display screens located on either end of the room. Don't be misled by the empty space, the plain-looking yellow grid lines on the wall. This room is the most exciting and technologically advanced form of recreation Starfleet has to offer. This is the holodeck, one of four such facilities located on Deck 11. In here, through the use of holographic projections, force fields, and matter replication, the crew can experience any environment they can imagine. You'll often find me in here hiking the mountains of my native Alaska, or engaged in other quiet pursuits. The Captain's Quarters. Though these are Captain Picard's personal quarters, and he is a very private individual, we've decided that it was important to show you his room anyway, and in particular, one object. Not a certain flute, though it holds the memories of a lifetime for the captain. Nor this Klingon dagger, though it too holds great significance. What I wanted to show you was this Mintakan tapestry. The Mintakans came to regard Captain Picard as a god because of a breach in the Prime Directive. I believe the captain leaves the tapestry on display as a reminder to himself of the overriding importance of the Prime Directive in fulfilling our mission. Data's quarters. This very ordinary looking room houses an extraordinary individual. Our ship's third in command and operations manager, Commander Data. You'll immediately note the absence of a bed in here. That's because Data is an android who never needs to sleep, although he has experimented with the concept. He's also experimented with a lot of other things, as you can tell by looking around the room. His violin, his painting, his Sherlock Holmes costume. Even the food dish that belongs to his cat Spot are all evidence of his desire to experience everything that we humans do, to know what it means to be one of us. Though I sometimes think he misses the point, it's the constant striving to achieve, to learn, to learn and experience all that one possibly can that helps form the very definition of humanity. And in that respect, data is at least as human as any of us. Troy's quarters. These quarters reveal very little about their occupant. The bunk, food replicator unit, and desktop viewer are all standard issue. But then the officer who occupies them, Commander Deanna Troy, doesn't make a habit of disclosing too much information about herself either. A part of that, I think, goes along with being ship's counselor the one person on board the Enterprise that everyone runs to with their problems. In that role, you don't get into the habit of revealing too much about yourself. But I can personally vouch for the fact that hidden behind Deanna's serene exterior, there is a complex, compassionate individual. Wharf's quarters. This foreboding suite belongs to our ship's security officer, the equally foreboding Lieutenant Worf, the only Klingon officer in Starfleet. Worf's heritage as a member of that warrior race is obviously very important to him. You can see evidence of that everywhere you look in here. Some might say that the prominent display of these artifacts, 
the statue of the legendary Klingon Emperor Kalis, the Batleth, the numerous swords and ceremonial items that decorate these walls, proves the impossibility of peaceful coexistence with the Klingons, that even the best of them can never shed their warrior heritage. I disagree. To me, their, pre to me, their presence embodies the Vulcan concept of Idik, infinite diversity in infinite combination, words that while not explicitly spelled out in the Starfleet Charter, go straight to the heart of everything the United Federation of Planets stands for. Starship USS Enterprise NCC 1701D. 